Hello. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, my topic is going to be Balcata Aquinas syndrome and how it pertains to radiology and how radiology is used to help uh, with the diagnosis and treatment of this disease. Let me first begin by introducing myself. <clears throat> my name is Jason Wang, and I'm a physician. I am a radiologist. I have a uh, my medical degree and also uh, did my residency training in, in radiology with a subsequent uh, subspecialty training in um, MRI. Um, so this, you know, I, I'm big part of my everyday job is, is reading uh, MRIs and especially uh, the spine. And so it's not infrequent that I come across either a request to evaluate for cauda equina, or I actually find, you know, something that does look a cauda equina. And so we're just going to go over simply, uh, you know, some of the, the background of uh, CES and then some of the anatomy that we see with MRI, and then we'll go over a few cases just to demonstrate uh, what it looks like. Let's go to the next slide. So Cotaclina syndrome. So first, it, it is a clinical diagnosis, and thus the term should not be used in a radiology report unless the appropriate symptoms and signs are known. Um, symptoms include low back pain, motor weakness, saddle anesthesia, bladder dysfunction, and bowel incontinence. And the causes are basically anything that can compress the cotyquine and nerve roots within the fecal sac, which is uh, where the ner nerve roots are traveling down within the spinal canal. I apologize for the pause there. I was trying to figure out how so I could show the mouse because that's going to be very important when I'm showing you <coughs> the MRIs. So getting back uh, again, the causes, anything that basically is going to cause compression of the cotyquine and nerve roots uh, within the fecal sac. And there's a wide list and this could be degenerative, which is probably the most common and that includes like when you have the big uh, disc herniations or disc bulges or extrusions that are causing compression of the sac. You can have also spondylolisthesis, and that's where the vertebral bodies have shifted upon one another. Uh, any kind of thing that contributes to the uh, to canal stenosis, whether that could be a hemorrhage within the spinal canal, you can have cysts, you can have big facets, big hypertrophied facets with um, uh, uh, ligamentum along there that gets really thickened. So all those can be contributing factors under degenerative inflammatory, um, anything, any kind of inflammation you can have. Um, for example, there's inflammatory diseases such as ankylosing spondylitis. Um, of course, traumatic can be, you can have uh, fractures, you can have bone fragments, you can have shifting of the spine uh, due to the fractures, uh, all causing um, compression of the, the thecal sac and cotyquine and nerve roots. Uh, epidural hematomas from trauma or surgery can be a cause. Infection, any kind of infection, you can have arachnoiditis where the infection causing the the nerve roots to be clumped together, uh, any kind of uh, epidural abscess. Um, and of course, tumors, um, you have various types of tumors that can be uh, space occupying lesions within the, the canal. Um, you also can have vascular causes such as uh, aortic dissection or AVMs. 
Um, and again, at the end, I put space occupying lesions, which basically most of these uh, above mentioned are space occupying lesions that are basically taking the room of the spinal canal. And then I put a question mark down there at the bottom just to note that uh, as you're working up cotequinus syndrome and you get imaging, sometimes you might have a negative MRI and you're still having symptoms that are cotequina symptoms, cotequina syndrome. So just having uh, a negative MRI is, is not the definitive um, test to say that you do not have CES. So going back to radiology, you, just talking about maybe three modalities that might come up on you know, this type of workup when you're having uh, some of these symptoms. Plain radiograph, uh, they might get plain radiographs as a, you know, ordering the initial study. It really has no um, important part in uh, diagnosing or helping diagnose CES. Um, because you're just not going to see anything in the <clears throat> spinal canal. You know, just plain radiographs are basically looking for the, at the bones. Mm -hmm. CT myelogram, it can be useful in patients in whom MRI is contraindicated or um, where it's not available. So let me give you a couple examples. Uh, someone who has a spinal stimulator or a pacemaker where they're not able to have an MRI, CT myelogram might be uh, useful. Or sometimes MRI is just not available. Some smaller hospitals, you know, might not have MRI, or if they do, uh, they don't offer it 24-7. So, you know, if you come in late at night and they don't have MRI, um, you know, CT myelogram might be an option. This is uh, a bit more of an invasive study because it requires contrast being injected into the fecal sac where the nerve roots are traveling. So it does require a radiologist uh, to basically be doing an L lumbar puncture to where the needle is going into the fecal sac and injecting the contrast. And lastly, MRI. Um, M MRI is really the imaging modality of choice. It is the gold standard. And <clears throat> we'll, we'll be seeing how um, the anatomy, how important it is uh, to be seen with MRI and or how well it is seen and in some cases of, of how it basically can confirm the diagnosis. So moving on to the anatomy. Uh, I have uh, a case of an MRI. This is a case I read not too long ago. And I, I tried to find the most normal looking spine. So this is close to a normal spine. And really what we're looking for in sequences are sagittal T2, which is going from basically slicing from left to right or right to left through the spine. And then axial T2 and T1, which is more slices that are going from top down or down up. And the T2 is, there's different types, types of sequence. T2 means you're, you're, it's a type of sequence that is uh, fluid sensitive. So um, it's good for looking uh, for anything that has fluid content. Uh, T1 is, is a fat sensitive sequence. So it's um, good for looking for you know, structures that have fat. So uh, the, the image on the right side is an example of a sagittal T2 sequence. And this is right about down through the midline. And what we're looking here is you're having vertebral bodies uh, of the lumbar spine. This is down into the sacrum. So this would be L5, 4, 3, 2, and 1 right here. And then, of course, you have the discs in between right here. So remember I said sagittal T2 sequence is a fluid sensitive sequence. And you can see here, fluid is gonna be bright on T2. So here you have the discs that are bright. Discs are normally hydrated. So some of you guys might have reports, MRI reports that might say something about there is disc desiccation. And so as we get older, basically the discs lose that 
that fluid content within it. And that's what it's saying is these discs have basically desiccated or they've lost their fluid. And what that looks like on MRI is you're gonna see black instead of this bright here. Uh, also here you can see we're looking at um, the lower portion of the uh, spinal cord and in the lumbar spine. So it's basically the lumbar spinal cord. And as it comes down lower into the upper lumbar spine, you can see it kind of forms this uh, tip, this pointed tip, and that's called the conus medullaris. So at that point, that is the end of the spinal cord. And from there on, you have the cotequine and nerve roots that are traveling down through the spine. And we'll see that's where cotequine syndrome comes into place because it's below where the spinal cord ends. And so the, the spinal um, nerves that are being affected, the cotequine nerve roots are after the the cord has already ended. So I'm going to just show you a couple of sequential images uh, going sagittally and then also axially. Let's see here. So this is uh, kind of a blown up picture of the lumbar spine. And I'm not going all the way through out far, but this is going uh, from right to left. And you can start seeing here, you, you know, you see the vertebral bodies and then the discs in between. And these openings here are called your neural foramen. And that is where <clears throat> after the nerve roots leave the fecal sac, they're coming out into the neural frame. So just watch as we, as I scroll down. So we're going from, again, from the side and then towards the midline. And there again, you can see, I said that was called the conus medullaris. And then below here is all the nerve roots. And your thecal sac is basically this sac within the spinal canal that includes the cotequine and nerve roots. Up higher, it includes the uh, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spinal cord. So when you're getting a lumbar puncture, they're basically in putting the needle into this thecal sac and either drawing out fluid like for a lumbar puncture, or say when I told you about the CT myelogram, they're injecting contrast in here to highlight the thecal sac. Now, if you're getting an epidural, epidural is outside of this thecal sac, and it's the um, basically the layer right outside the thecal sac, and that could be you know anterior, or posterior there. So now we're just going to the other side. And we're getting to the other side of the neural frame and where the left neural or left or right neural for um, nerve root is coming out. So I'm just gonna scroll here again so you guys can get an idea. So neural frame in going towards when the, more the midline, the fecal sac is there and to the other neural frame in there. So going next to the axial image and again, this is, I can tell this is an axial T2 because here's the fecal sac and this is the CSF, cerebral spinal fluid within the fecal sac and fluid is bright. So this is a T2 image. You can see we're up higher in the lumbar spine because these are the kidneys right here. So I know this is up higher in the lumbar spine and we're seeing the lower portion of the spinal cord here. And remember, as I said, as we go lower down, that cord is tapering, keeps tapering down smaller, smaller. And this is, you know, the conus medullaris. And you already start seeing a bunch of nerve, uh, nerve roots already here within the fecal sac. So as that conus ends, all these little black dots within the fecal sac are the cotequine and nerve roots. And the, the fecal sac you can see is outlined here, right here. And just for additional anatomy, uh, this I had mentioned before, um, these are your fat facets here. So these can get big, hypertrophied, and then your ligament flavum is this portion right here. 
So that also can get really thickened. So you can see there's a lot of things that can contribute to <clears throat> cause uh, trouble to the fecal sac. And so you can have the disc bulging out, you can have this becoming thickened, hypertrophied, and then you can have the facets getting big. Sometimes the facets can form these cysts that can also compress it. Um, again, you can see the kidneys over here, and this is called your psoas muscles on each side here. And this is the aorta up here. So case one, a 39-year-old male presents with severe low back pain that radiates into the buttock, saddle anesthesia, leg numbness, and toe weakness. No bladder or bowel dysfunction. Um, this is, uh, again, sagittal image right near the midline. I'm gonna show you on the next image slice so we can see where we are. So here's sacrum, five, four, three, two, one of the lumbar spine. So in general, the spine looks pretty good. You can see here, remember I said the disc desiccation, you can see here, here, and here, it's becoming more black. So these discs are becoming desiccated. And this one and at L5S1 are more narrow. And what are we seeing here at L4-5? You can see this big, you know, this disc herniation, extrusion, it's coming out. Basically, it looks like a tail coming out. And all these black things traveling down, those are the catequina nerve roots, and it looks like it's getting severely compressed. So using this in conjunction, you know, we'll look at the axial images. This is, <coughs> um, this is actually a T2 and this is a T1. So here uh, we're looking, I'm not seeing any of the bright fluid within the uh, fecal sac. And I'm looking over here at the T1 and you can actually see better that the disc part that was uh, extruded out is right here. So I'm following it with the mouse here. This is all disc extrusion that had come out. So what's remaining of the fecal sac is just this thin little portion here. So there's the CSF is basically being compressed out and all these catechoin and nerve roots are compressed in here. So this is an emergency and you can see actually here's a good example. So this patient uh, who I know a lot about because this was myself, uh, you can was having more left-sided symptoms initially. And you can see this is the nerve root, uh, L4 nerve root that has already gone out and it's actually not, not been um, compressed here. Where's the left side? You can't even see where it is. And I think I put this image just to show this was, um, I think a level above, you know, an axial T2 image. This is how the fecal sac should look. It should be nice, plump, wide open with the nerve roots here. And going back here, you can see, I. I you, you're not seeing anything. You're not seeing that bright CSF fluid or anything like that. This is a picture I got from the surgeon who took out uh, after <coughs> surgery, he took a picture and you know, these are millimeters. This is how much disc material he had to take out that was extruded um, from myself. And you can see it, it was a, quite a significant amount. And after talking with him, he said, as he got down to where the disc was, the area where it had been um, extruding out, he said it was under so much pressure that it continued to be squirting out basically as he was taking it. Um, so you can see there's you know, a significant amount and I would just like to say, make a distinction because, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, I, I had, I had what you did and I had surgery and, you know, they don't, what they don't realize is you can have disc bulges that are irritating nerves that are, are compressing nerves and that can be causing radiculopathy symptoms. The dis, the difference with CES is that you have this, um, if it's a disc herniation or extrusion, 
it is compressing these catequinin nerve roots to the point that it is cutting off their, their circulation, their blood supply. And so those nerve roots are getting ischemic. So while you can have a disc bulge that is uh, irritating a nerve root, that nerve root technically is okay. So once you have surgery you, or, or that disc bulge goes away, that nerve root is fine. These nerve roots that are, um, the catequinin nerve roots that are getting ischemic already have been uh, damaged. And that comes later to where, you know, is that damage going to be, are, can those nerve roots recover or are you going to have permanent damage? So case two is a 45 year old male, uh, status post twisting injury, low back pain, saddle anesthesia and bowel incontinence. Um, so the case that we just went over case one with myself, I did not have any power of bladder incontinence. Imaging wise, I cannot tell you, and I could, I, there's no way for me to, you know, predict to say this person is going to have bowel or bladder problems and this person won't. And, and you'll see, I mean, the cases are going to look very similar. Um, this guy, you can see here, he's got a uh, disc bulge. I, uh, I believe this is L3-4, we'll see. And yeah, again, okay, so here we got the sacrum, L5-4-3. So at 3-4, you can see a pretty good, nice disc bulge here. And it's compressing the, the nerve roots, catechinin nerve roots, severe compression on the thecal sac. And I think I got some slides here mixed up. So this, this image should be going with that case. And you can see here, here's the disc bulge coming out here or disc uh, extrusion. And this little part here would be the, the fecal sac. So case three is um, an 81 year old male. Uh, 80, 81 year old is a little bit unusual because usually when you have these uh, as a disc extrusion or protrusion disc bulge causing the problem, it's because you have this, the, the central part of the disc called the nucleus pulposus that is extruding out. And that's that hydrated portion. As you get older and those discs become dehydrated, that the risk of that is lower because you just don't have that, you know, soft jelly part of the disc anymore. Now, this guy, even though he's 81, he actually has a decent looking spine. You can see here, you know, there's still fluid in his disc somewhat. And at this level here, he's got this big disc extrusion, you know, coming down inferiorly also here looks pretty similar to what I had. And I think this is just another picture showing that. So, and I apologize, I think I got some slides mixed up. So that younger guy earlier, this is his disc protrusion here. And you can see it's uh, severely compressing the fecal sac and catechine nerve roots. You can see his facets, they're maybe a little bit mildly uh, hypertrophied. Um, and this one is actually the older guy. And the reason I can tell that is because you can look, these facets are pretty markedly hypertrophied with this ligamentum. So you're usually not gonna see that in the younger person. I can tell this, you know, this is an elderly patient here. Um, but in both cases, you can see the, you know, the, the disc extruded out and is severely compressing the catechinin nerve roots in the fecal sac. So just as a recap, catechinin syndrome in radiology, uh, again, CES is a clinical diagnosis. So, you know, the doctors are going to be coming there and they're going to be saying, you know, I need this emergent MRI, we've got saddle anesthesia, 
you know, bowel problems, uh, bladder, um, urinary retention, uh, pain down the, the legs. And, and actually the emergency doctors, they know how to get in a, uh, an MRI because those are, you know, when you give those buzzwords, it's, it's pretty much, uh, you know, you better get this MRI as soon as you can. Um, but as I said before, uh, you know, having those symptoms when we're doing the radiology report, it makes it to where we can say these findings, you know, are consistent with Cotaquinas syndrome. Um, if they aren't giving you those symptoms, you really should not be using that <clears throat> in your radiology report. So it is a, a diagnostic and surgical emergency. Again, I said, as I said before, you know, if they're giving you those uh, symptoms in the history, um, you know, that patient should be getting an MRI as soon as they can. And the reason being is, you know, you want to see what the cause is and because it's a surgical emergency and they're going to need to know what they're dealing with uh, and how to, you know, their approach to what they're going to be doing surgically wise. MRI is the gold standard, as we said, um, really the best test uh, to help confirm it. And uh, so you're gonna, you know, it's gonna help confirm the diagnosis. And as I said before, it's also gonna be a, a guide and roadmap uh, for the surgeon. You know, they're gonna know what level they're dealing with. They're gonna know how to approach it. You know, are they gonna be able to do a, just a microdiscectomy? Or are they gonna have to do a fusion and the laminectomy? They're gonna know, you know, am I gonna go on the right side or the left side for uh, laminal foraminotomy? and so forth. So MRI uh, is, it gives plenty of uh, useful information. And as we said, there, you know, there's going to be numerous etiologies. And, you know, what I showed before is, is what I see most commonly and probably is the most common cause of uh, acute cotyclinus syndrome. Um, so I, I think that's about it. And I, I thank you for your time. And I just want to say, you know, you know, this is a pretty severe disease. And this is a picture of, of myself back in 2016. And I would uh, <clears throat> often joke um, with the nurses because I, I am a, into, big into mountain biking. And I was saying, and this is literally uh, a true story, a week before I had come into the hospital here, I was out on, you know, a three, four hour mountain bike ride uh, without a thought in my mind that I would be in the hospital the next day, unable to walk and have, you know, no feeling my legs and so forth. Um, this is my youngest daughter at the um, visiting me at the time. She's a little over a year old here. But I would just like to end by saying, you know, many of us that have suffered this disease, there is hope. Um, don't give up because I am a, a good example that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, I made myself, uh, I, as far as my recovery, uh, I had a, a really excellent recovery, and you can see this is actually 2021. I'm um, mountain biking quite frequently, and this was a few months ago, and this is not a picture of ET. This is me mountain biking and, and jumping off uh, a jump over here, and I'm, you know, going to land here, so... Anyways, that uh, is my topic here, and uh, hopefully I can answer some of your questions, and um, hopefully this gives you a, a better understanding of how radiology can play a part in, in Cotaquinas syndrome. So thank you.